Hello and welcome to lecture 8 of our amazing intro introduction to computational physics course, Physics 352. And I am your instructor, Sasha Chikovskoy, as always. Today, we're going to be talking about planetary orbits in the solar system. And uh, as I mentioned, this is lecture eight, part one. So how are we going to uh, make it happen? How are we going to solve for planetary motion? Let us make the simplest assumption. Let us consider our star, which I'm going to draw here uh, in yellow. And that's not how the star is drawn. Obviously, I haven't practiced this. Uh, let's try again. So we have a star and uh, we will have an orbit around the star. Actually, let's make it bigger. I haven't been doing this in a while, so I definitely need to learn how to fit in this little space here. So uh, here is a star. <laughs> All right. Uh, Give me a couple more tries, I'm gonna get it. Okay, so that's our star. Uh, and then we will have our orbit around the star. So we're going to introduce coordinate system, uh, x and y. And then for a planet on an orbit around the star, uh, we're going to denote its position in space via the two coordinates, x and y. And uh, we're going to uh, assume that uh, this is a test particle. So the mass of the uh, planet is much, much less than the mass of the star. So the star doesn't really care that the planet is there. Uh, all the star does is uh, uh, generates gravitational potential that the planet moves around it. So the only thing that we care about is that the planet has a force that the star pulls it with. And so that force is F. And uh, that force leads to acceleration. F equals to ma. Uh, and uh, the projection of the force along the radial direction, so that would be uh, the radial direction, uh, will be minus g times m of the star times little m of the planet divided by uh, the distance uh, squared, uh, where uh, the distance squared, of course, is simply uh, the sum of the squares of x and y. Um, so what are the equations of motion? Well, if we know the uh, force projection along the radial direction, we also can compute force projections along the x and the y directions. And uh, then we can uh, write down equations in projection onto x and the y directions. So equations of motion in these projections uh, will take this form. So along the x direction, we're going to write that uh, m times x double dot, which is second derivative of x with respect to time, that is m times a acceleration in the x direction. And so that is equal to the force in the x direction according to this formula. Uh, and at the same time, the force in the x direction will be uh, that, but projected onto the x direction. And so that will be minus g m star m of the planet divided by the square of the radius and multiplied by x over r, uh, which will be uh, the cosine of the, the angle that the planet direction makes with the x-axis. Similarly, uh, we're going to have m y double dot equal to f y and equal to minus g a mass of the star times mass of the planet times r squared times r uh, divided by r squared times y over r. So these are our equations of motion that describe uh, the planet. So with this, I would like to make a couple of notes here. 
Uh, first of all, as we can see, uh, that mass actually cancels. So we can uh, take this in parentheses. So this was to be a force, but then we're going to be able to cancel mass. So note one, um, mass cancels. Okay, that's really good news. Uh, and uh, note two, as we mentioned, but let me uh, put it down in the record, is that sun doesn't move. Okay, so the sun is pinned down uh, because the mass of the planet is much smaller than the mass of the star. Perfect. So now let us um, specialize to the case of a circular motion. So this uh, kind of weird orbit that's not even closed, uh, it's supposed to be closed, we'll see in a second, um, in the case of a planet around the sun. Uh, this planet will be going on a circular orbit with a constant radius, with a constant distance uh, towards the center. And so we're going to start with a circular motion. Uh, namely, uh, we're going to be assuming that uh, the radius of the orbit is a constant. So the distance to the star from the planet stays always the same. So the planetary orbit is a circle. All right, so what are the equations of motion in this case? Uh, well, uh, let's uh, write it out. X double dot is equal to minus GMS over all that times X, right? So our equations of motion r x double dot is equal to minus gm star divided by r cubed uh, times x. And so from here, we can immediately find a solution because this equation of motion looks just like uh, an equation for a simple harmonic oscillator that we've already seen previously. Uh, so what is our solution? Well, it's a sine or a cosine wave uh, with uh, uh, this as the square of our natural frequency. So we can write down that the solution here is given by some amplitude a, which is a constant factor, uh, times the cosine of the square root of this, that will be our natural frequency, which is gms over r cubed. Uh, and uh, multiplied by time. So that is our solution. So of course, this whole thing is under the cosine. So what about y? Well, y uh, will be uh, basically the same. It's just we have to figure out what is the right combination um, of sines and cosines such that uh, we get a circular motion. And uh, as you see, if x is a cosine, y should be a sine of the same argument so that our planet moves on a circle, uh, so this will be exactly the same, except we replaced cosine with a sine. And uh, of course, for simplicity, uh, we can, ooh, everything is falling. For simplicity, what we can do is we can just replace the amplitude here with the radius, because radius is a constant, right? So. We're just going to plug that in here. So far, so good, right? So let's now ask, what is the period of motion? Well, uh, if we know uh, that our motion is periodic because sines and cosines are periodic, the period is 2 pi, so that once this omega times t uh, increases by 2 pi, uh, then we're going to come back to the same point, right? Uh, two pi later, we're going to be in exactly the same place. So um, we are going to demand uh, that square root of g m s over r cubed uh, times t is equal to two pi. Uh, that will be our period. And so in fact, we're going to denote 
uh, our period as a capital T instead of the little t. So we're going to have it like that. And so from here, uh, we immediately can get that our period is going to be equal to uh, something uh, times Uh, times r to the three halves. So this is Kepler's th third law. And uh, that's awesome. We now have recalled how to derive that. Uh, finally, uh, this is all great and pretty, but what we need to know is how to actually solve this system of equations numerically. And when we do so, an important choice comes about is the choice of units. And uh, let's pick the units such that all the numbers are not too far from one, because one is a good number. It's not too large, not too small. In numerics, you always try to avoid numbers which are huge, because then you can run into machine precision issues. So one, uh, would be, uh, let's say, a period. Let's say Earth has a period of one year. So let us choose our units. Such that um, we will have for Earth Um, we're going to have the radius also equals to 1. So we're going to set the radius equal to 1 and the period equal to 1. So this will be 1 cubed times 1 uh, and that will be equal to 2 pi. So what we've done is we have uh, chosen the units uh, such that t is in years and uh, r in astronomical units. So this is our choice of units. And uh, in the next part of the lecture, 8.2, uh, we're actually going to go ahead and figure out how to code this up, how to put a planet on an orbit and let it go around uh, numerically uh, inside of uh, our uh, OD solver. So I'm going to see you there and I hope that you will join me and have fun. See you. Hello and welcome to part two of our fantastic lecture eight. Where, as advertised, we are going to be talking about numerically solving our equations of motion of a planet around the sun. As you can see right over, which way? Uh, over there, right? Like you see on the diagram, our little planet is going around the sun. So how do we solve these equations of motion? Well, uh, let us remember that we have an ODE solver that can take an arbitrary number of dependent variables and in this case, dependent variables are uh, the two coordinates for sure. Uh, but remember that we cannot just solve an OD that's second order, like x double dot equals to the right hand side. We have to break it down. x dot is equal to vx, and then uh, vx dot is equal to something else. So we are going to have four variables. Four dependent variables, x, vx, y, and vy. Uh, and uh, the equations of motion are going to take are going to take uh, this form. D, 
uh, our vector of solution, let's call it a uh, dt is equal to f of a. And that is our vector of solution. Don't confuse it with acceleration. I just ran out of letters, so I decided to use a as a vector. So uh, how are we going to solve this equation of motion? Well, very easy. Uh, we're going to write down that dx dt is equal to vx. And uh, then we're going to write down that dvx dt uh, is going to be equal to minus gms over r squared times x over r. Uh, we can also write down dy dt is equal to vy and vy itself, its derivative will be dy, dy, dvy dt is equal to minus uh, g time mass of the sun uh, times y over r. Just like uh, we wrote them out uh, over there um, to the right. And uh, um, we can, of course, simplify this a little bit. Uh, we can erase r at the bottom and uh, replace square with a cubed. We can do it over here as well. So we can write it like this. Okay, so this is a system of our four equations, one, two, three, four, for our uh, four uh, variables. And uh, we're going to uh, start integration in our homework in uh, question one. Let's choose a different color for fun. We're going to start integration uh, with the following initial conditions. Uh, we're going to pick x equals to 1, y equals to 0, and uh, we're going to pick vx equals to 0 and vy equal to 2 pi. Why do we do that? Well, because the expectation is that in this case we're going to get a circular orbit. So as before, uh, if we draw our star, and as you see, I've gotten much better drawing stars uh, in the last uh, 20 minutes. Uh, and if we draw a circle around our star, which is this supposed to represent, uh, then if we additionally draw the x and the y axis, so that's y, uh, that's x, our v initial at t equals to zero will be pointing up. It will have components vx, vy, which are equal to zero and two pi right from here. And our initial coordinates uh, will correspond to x equals to one and y equals to zero. Uh, so that is our uh, the set of initial coordinates. So the first goal will be to verify that you get um, a circular orbit. Uh, and uh, also uh, then let's have some fun. Let's try and modify this orbit so that it's no longer circular. And uh, why not just add one to each of these components? So then let's uh, increase Vx and Vy by one each. So Vx will become one and Vy will become two pi plus one. Uh, and what we should do, um, what we should get it as a result is an ellipse. Uh, 
uh, which is pretty cool. And uh, it uh, turns out it's much harder to solve ellipses numerically than circles, uh, although circles are actually hard enough already. So for all of these integrations, I recommend that you use the most accurate solver possible. So uh, it's best to use Runge Cutter 4 uh, so that ellipse doesn't shift because as we will see in the next slide, slide, slide board, on the next slide board we will see that our ellipse actually is not supposed to be shifting anywhere once you place a planet on the, an elliptical orbit or on any orbit uh, that's bound to the object it will be an ellipse that doesn't change shape so that's really a nice feature of Newtonian gravity in which we live in so if the gravity is only from a single point source which is a star uh, then our planet will be an ellipse uh, or a circle which is a specific case of an ellipse um, as long as the planet is bound to the star. There could of course be parabolic and hyperbolic orbits which we will not get into, uh, but you're welcome to ask me questions. But those orbits are not bound, they will fly away eventually to infinity. And so um, in this case of uh, dealing with planets on orbits around stars, we actually are going to take great care in figuring out that our solution is an ellipse that doesn't shift. And so we're going to be using a high accuracy integrator, RK4, so that the ellipse doesn't uh, shift or drift. Uh, otherwise, you will see if you decrease the time step, sorry, if you increase the time step or decrease the number of time steps or use uh, RK2 or even Euler, you will see that the planetary orbit just goes completely crazy. So you might start with something that looks like that and over time uh, the orbit might just basically fly away. So we don't want this uh, to happen and so it's because of this that we're going to use a high accuracy method. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this uh, at all, uh, but there is a, a class of integrators which can uh, completely alleviate this issue so that even if you use a large time step, um, they will still maintain the elliptical shape of the orbit. Uh, those are called symplectic integrators. And perhaps we'll hear from one of the teams that are dealing with the motion of rockets, uh, of planets, uh, or uh, just the gravitational interacting bodies. Maybe they will report to us uh, what is a symplectic integrator, why it is a really good idea to have it, and uh, why it works as well as it does. Uh, I will not be touching that, but if you're interested, please ask me, especially if you're working in one of those teams uh, that uh, are going to be benefiting from that. More than happy to chat about this. Great. With this long winded story, uh, it's time for us to move on to the next part, three of our lecture eight, uh, where we're going to uh, talk about why uh, this orbit is an ellipse uh, and uh, how does this ellipse look like. Actually, we will not be deriving the ellipse uh, solution, but we're going to write it down. Uh, and that already is going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to see you there in just a couple of minutes uh, that it takes me to clean this board. Uh, section three, part three of our lecture eight. See you there. Hello and welcome to part three of our lecture eight. Here we're going to be talking about the analytical description of orbits around stars. So suppose that we are still considering Earth around the Sun or any other light planet that doesn't cause any jiggle in the planet, it's in, in the star itself. So what we will have is in the case of Newtonian gravity, uh, so that the force goes as one over distance squared, In this case, our orbit will be an ellipse if it's bound to the central source.
which is super cool. So what is going to be our uh, geometrical expression for the ellipse? So let's introduce the coordinates. So that will be our coordinate x and that will be our coordinate y. And our ellipse will look something like that. Uh, it doesn't really look like an ellipse. It should be more like this. Oh my goodness. Okay, I have to redraw this. I apologize for my drawing skills or lack thereof. All right. Let's try again. Okay, so that's better. So that will be a focal point of the ellipse. Uh, so that's where our sun will be. X and Y coordinates. And uh, the position uh, on the ellipse uh, will be kept track by an angle theta. So that will be our little mass M and that will be our star at the center, which for some reason turned blue since the last time we drew it. Drew it. So the expression for the orbit uh, in these uh, polar coordinates, r and theta, is r is equal to a times one minus this uh, number e, which is eccentricity squared. Uh, divided by 1 plus the same number, eccentricity, times cosine uh, theta. So let's try and plug in a few numbers. If we plug in theta equal to 0, uh, then we're going to get um, r is equal to a times 1 minus e1 plus e. Right, because 1 minus e squared is, uh, is that, 1 minus e times 1 plus e. And we're going to divide by 1 plus e times cos of 0, but cosine of 0 is 1. So we're going to divide by 1 plus e. So 1 plus e goes away. And so then uh, the uh, distance to the planet on this side is going to be a times 1 minus the eccentricity. On the other side, the cosine becomes minus 1. And so when uh, theta is equal to pi, uh, the expression will be 1 minus e times 1 plus e divided by 1 minus e. 1 minus e will get canceled. And so we find that the furthest away distance that the planet will make uh, from the star uh, is going to be a 1 plus e. And as you can tell from here, if we were to add the two, uh, we're going to get two times a. So a here is semi-major axis. Of our of our awesome ellipse. Okay, fantastic. So uh, these a and e actually are important parameters that are specifying our orbit. They tell us how uh, extended the orbit is, and they also tell us uh, how elongated it will be. So A tells us how big it is, and E is how squished in the vertical direction it is compared to the horizontal direction if we draw it in this way. So uh, there are uh, actually four variables that describe the ellipse, and uh, you can already maybe see uh, three of them uh, over here, but there are four variables that we use to solve the system, right? So let's recall that. So we have four variables, and those variables are x, vx, y, and vy. So these are the four dependent variables. And uh, these dependent variables um, correspond to uh, what we call the orbital elements. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, those are the elements that comprise this formula, the variables that parameterize it. So that will be the semi-major axis, uh, the eccentricity. Uh, then there is also theta. That's the position on the orbit. And there is a fourth one. So what that could be? Well, here we drew the uh, elliptical orbit like its semi-major axis is horizontal, but in reality it could be in uh, any orientation. And the theta angle of this uh, point of closest approach, uh, which is called periaps, and that is called apoaps, or uh, perihelion and epihelion, uh, so uh, these two points, they can uh, uh, make an arbitrary angle with the x direction, of course. Orbits can have different uh, orientations. And so that angle is denoted by theta e. And so what we can do in order to reflect it in our formula is uh, we're going to subtract theta e from theta so that when theta is equal to theta e, uh, then uh, our planet is at uh, periapse. And so theta e is the angle of uh, the periapse. Um, so if we know the orbital elements, uh, we can go back to the four dependent variables that we use to solve our uh, system of equations. If we know these four variables, we can also go from here to the orbital elements. And I'm telling you this because actually you will be doing precisely that in the homework and we're going to look a little bit at how uh, to do that. Um, so that is what we will be doing in uh, assignment 6.2 uh, where we would like to know these given those or the opposite. Uh, and uh, vice versa. Knowing this, we will be also wanting to go back. So we're going to want to be able to go back and forth. And uh, one other really cool thing um, about this sort of dual representation is that we have some conserved quantities. Uh, and uh, uh, one is that we will have conserved energy. So that will be uh, denoted with letter u. That will be the square of velocity over two. We assume we set mass of our particle equal to one for simplicity. Uh, or you can think of it as energy of our particle or planet per unit mass. So that will be our uh, kinetic minus potential energy. And also the Re's angular momentum. So we will denote that with h, and that will be x times vy minus y times uh, vx. So these are conserved quantities in terms of our dependent variables. But we also can express them in terms of orbital elements. And uh, here we will be able to write that u is equal to minus g mass of the star divided by 2a. Uh, that turns out to be the total energy. It only depends on the mass of the star and the semi-major axis, and uh, our angular momentum 
also can be expressed in uh, this form. One second, I'm going to, need to make some room over here. Right, clean this up. So that's the expression for the angular momentum for a circular orbit. And so this extra piece, uh, let me actually make it even prettier. This extra piece here, the second square root, comes from the fact that um, we're trying to generalize it for an elliptical orbit. Uh, all right, so uh, this is our angular momentum in terms of the orbital elements, and this is the energy in terms of the orbital elements. And because our energy and angular momentum are constants, they are conserved, uh, it turns out that um, both A and E will be conserved as well. Of course, the mass of the star doesn't change. So that means that uh, A and E are also constant. Uh, which is really cool. Uh, it means that there is a lot of things that don't change, which makes it easier for us to understand how the system works. Um, there is actually another conserved quantity over here, and uh, that is this one, theta e. Uh, that is actually uh, a, an accidental conserved quantity, as it's called. Uh, so it is purely due to the fact uh, that the force goes as 1 over r squared. Uh, that is because of the Newtonian gravity. Um, and uh, uh, the reason why uh, theta e is a conserved quantity is because in Newtonian gravity the ellipse does not precess. It stays put, uh, as we discussed uh, earlier. And... Uh, this is precisely what will allow us to test how well our runge kata 4 algorithm is able to keep the ellipse in place because if the ellipse precesses a four Newtonian gravity, it is only doing so because of the purely numerical reasons. And I discussed this more uh, in the homework assignment. So uh, now that we have uh, put it all together. Let me maybe move this over here so that it's clear. A and E also conserved. Uh, and uh, theta E is accidental conserved quantity uh, due to f going as 1 over r squared. Um, it reflects that ellipse um, doesn't persist. All right, so I can now take this out so that things are cleaner. Okay, fabulous. Now that we're done with this, I can call this a wrap. Our section three, uh, part three of our lecture eight is done. And we're going to move to the last part of lecture eight, uh, where we will discuss how to include the influence of other planets on, uh, on the planet that we're interested in. In particular, we're gonna be interested in the precession of Mercury 
because of the presence of other planets. Without other planets, uh, theta e would be a conserved quantity. So Mercury orbit, which is the closest planet to the sun, will stay on a beautiful ellipse that doesn't change in time. But due to several effects, it precesses. And one of these effects that we're going to explore is the effect of other planets on Mercury. That's precisely what we're going to see in the next part. I'm going to see you there. Stay with me. Hello and welcome back to the last part of our lecture 8, part 4. Here we're going to talk about the effects of other planets on the little planet that we have been considering the orbit of. So in the real solar system, uh, the force of course is not exactly Newtonian. The force doesn't scale as one over distance squared because there are multiple gravitating bodies orbiting around the Sun. Uh, Jupiter, the chief most important of them because it's the most massive and it's pretty close to uh, to the sun. Uh, that's one reason for that. But there is also of course the other. If you come close enough to the sun, effects of general relativity kick in. Uh, and uh, both of these effects uh, they cause the orbits of planets to precess. Uh, the ellipses are no longer staying put as they would in Newtonian gravity. Uh, the theta e um, is changing in time. And that will be a question on the problem set to figure out how fast the precession is happening of the orbits in the case of multiple planets. So uh, let's try and figure out how to numerically account for the fact that there are multiple planets present in the system uh, and uh, their effect on our pure orbit, a pure, poor orbit of uh, Mercury. So suppose that we have our Sun and uh, that we have Mercury on an orbit and uh, we will also have Jupiter on an orbit. So now our Mercury feels the force from the Sun, but it also feels the force from Jupiter. I'm not drawing the arrows to scale. Um, just uh, what's important here is that the force will be pulling uh, Mercury towards Jupiter. Uh, that's what Jupiter does. And uh, another force will be pulling towards uh, the Sun. So the sum of both of these forces are going to give us the net force. So the net force acting on uh, Mercury is going to be the sum of the two. So let's uh, write uh, the sum, this force as the sum of this plus that. So this force first uh, will be minus g mass of the sun divided by the distance squared. So that's the distance between the sun and uh, uh, Mercury. So we will denote that as Rm. Uh, and we're going to multiply that, of course, by the mass of Mercury, so that is the force, and in order to make it a vector, we need to multiply it by uh, Rm vector divided by Rm scalar, which is the length of Rm. So that is uh, the contribution of the Sun, and now we're going to include the contribution uh, from Jupiter. So that's what we're going to write over here. So uh, similarly, we need to plug in the same exact expression, but for uh, the mass of the Jupiter. Uh, 
and here it's no longer going to be uh, the distance from the Sun uh, to Mercury you see it's really difficult to erase okay um, uh, we're going to, to divide this now uh, by the uh, distance to Jupiter. So this will be Rj minus Rm squared. And uh, we're going to uh, multiply this by Rm minus Rj. Oops. So let me make this more consistent. Okay, so this will be Rm minus Rj divided by Rm minus Rj. Okay. So what we've done is we have replaced the distance to the sun with the distances between the uh, between Mercury and Jupiter. So that distance, this distance is R M minus R J, uh, and uh, this vector um, that goes from Jupiter to Mercury is going to be Rm minus Rj. Uh, this vector that goes from the Sun to Mercury, we denote that as Rm. So uh, we replace the mass of the Sun with the mass of Jupiter. We keep mass of Mercury the same. And then we replace Rm everywhere, this vector, from the body that is uh, gravitationally acting on Mercury uh, to Mercury. So in this case, uh, we're going to go from this vector to that vector, from Jupiter to Mercury, instead of from the Sun to Mercury. So we replace Rm with Rm minus Rj. So that is Rj. Rm minus Rj is this vector from J to M. So that's precisely what we've done, fully analogous uh, to uh, the expression uh, for the force of the Sun on Mercury. So with these two contributions, uh, we have now computed the full force in vector form acting on Mercury from both the Sun and uh, Jupiter. So let us now uh, work it out in components, because we work in components, remember, uh, in our numerical method. So let's change the color, make it more exciting. So let's write out what Rm is. Rm is, in terms of components along the x and the y directions, it's xm, ym. No surprise over here. Rj, very similar, similarly Xj and Yj. And uh, then from here, we can now compute what Rm minus Rj is. Uh, this is going to be equal to, not surprisingly, Xm minus Xj and Ym minus Yj. Uh, uh, so what is going to be the length of this vector? Well, uh, that is going to be the square root of the sum of the squares of its components. So it will be xm minus xj squared plus ym minus yj squared. Um, and it has to be squared over here. So let me erase this one. Awesome. 
So this is the expression for uh, the distance between Mercury and Jupiter. This is the expression for the vector uh, difference between Mercury and uh, Jupiter. And uh, now we can write down equations of motion in vector form. Uh, and that will be mass of Mercury uh, times the acceleration of Mercury, which is V dot, or the radius vector of Mercury, double dot. Uh, that is equal to the force acting on Mercury, which is that. Just like that. So we plug this over here, and uh, that's our vector equation for um, how Mercury will move around under the action of Jupiter and the Sun's gravitational pulls. So in the homework, uh, your goal will be to figure out how the forces of both the Sun and Jupiter are going to affect um, what would have otherwise been a nice and elliptical non precession orbit of uh, Mercury. But that would have only been, only been if we didn't have Jupiter in the picture. Now that Jupiter enters the picture, uh, its periodic tugs on Mercury will perturb the orbit and cause it to precess. So that's precisely what uh, we would like to do. For simplicity, we're only going to have uh, one uh, body for whose orbit we're solving. So we're going to fix Jupiter to be going on a circular orbit equal to its uh, semi-major axis uh, in radius, and we're going to pin down the Sun. So both Jupiter and the Sun are, are prescribed in motion, so the Sun stays fixed and Jupiter goes around a, with the right period. Uh, we just prescribe that by hand. So what we do is we say we're going to fix uh, Jupiter's orbit Um, so that it goes circular orbit. Um, and more information is uh, in the uh, homework assignment itself. So once we do that, we're going to watch a Mercury's orbit precess. So uh, the precession um, that we expect from all the contributions of all the planets, which is what you also will do in the homework, uh, is going to lead to around 530 arc seconds per century. That is actually very, very little uh, because uh, one arc second uh, is uh, one uh, over 3,600th of a degree. So one degree is 3,600 arc seconds. Um, so you would think, okay, well, that's probably what this probably explains uh, all the precession of Mercury, which uh, we see. But it turns out that Mercury actually precesses much more than that, quite a bit more. So why is there such a difference? Is there another extra planet Uh, it turns out, no. Uh, it's general relativistic effects that are causing this extra precession, and GR uh, leads to extra precession by 40 arc seconds a century.
that's all I have for you today. I am hoping that this will be a lot of exciting things to check out and try out. Uh, see with your own eyes how uh, the pulls and tugs of other planets will affect the orbit of Mercury. If you're interested in including general artistic precession, uh, there is more information on that uh, in our textbook, uh, Computational Physics, and you of course are very welcome to come and talk to me. There are a few other problems in the problem set which can also be uh, quite interesting. Uh, there are a couple of bonus problems which will give you extra credit uh, on top of the uh, regular grade. One last thing that I wanted to mention is that the problem set uh, as it is is only worth 90% of the regular problem set, so 90 points, not 100. The extra 10 points uh, you will be able to get once you provide uh, the reflections on the presentations that we record as part of uh, question 5 uh, in assignment 4 by your peers. So uh, that is the uh, set of videos that I'm going to include as part of the next lecture, lecture 9. And so once you watch that lecture and provide that feedback, uh, then you will be able to get uh, the full 100% points on the problem set. Uh, and I really hope that you have a good time with this. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I uh, am looking forward to seeing you uh, on Tuesday during the office hours. And I really hope that you have, you have a lot of fun. Uh, see you soon. Bye-bye.